Well, let me add my happy Father's Day a day early to all you dads out there. Since this is Father's Day weekend, I, this seems like a strange segue. But just over a week ago, we heard that a man walked into a nightclub in Orlando, Florida and opened fire, killing 49 people and injuring more than 50 others. And like many of you, I watched and listened on social media and in the news over the course of the last several days since that terrible tragedy to people in our country crying out for answers, raising issues like gun control laws in our country, the very real threat of radical terrorism, ISIS, and radical Islamism, and the targeting of those in the LGBT community for their sexual orientation. All these things, I think, are important issues that we should discuss. But I, before we get into the sermon, as your pastor, what I want to say to those of you who seek to follow Jesus in this world, our allegiance to Christ and his kingdom must come first. So before your political ideology, before your social views about policies and what should or shouldn't be done, on any issue should come your allegiance to Christ and his kingdom. Before your gender, your race, your color, your creed, even your sexual orientation should come your allegiance to Christ and his kingdom. And because we trust in Jesus and his word, we know that all people are created in the image of God. And therefore all people, all people are given a measure of his divine dignity and worth and value. And that for that reason, God deeply grieves the loss of life. And so should we. We should weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn, the Bible tells us. We should cry out for justice, not just in this world, but to our Lord for his mercy. And so toward that end, I've written this little prayer I'd like to lead us through. Your part will simply be to respond, Lord Jesus, have mercy. And I'll lead us through and then we'll get into the text. Lord Jesus, for those who wake each morning to fear and anxiety... For children who have lost mothers and fathers. For parents who weep and ache over lost children. For those who labor to rescue, heal, and restore. For officials and leaders who seek to bring justice and order. For those who harbor hatred and prejudice in their hearts. For those enslaved by anger and unforgiveness. For those of us who have become callous in our own comfort. And for all whose hearts are marred by pain and suffering. Lord Jesus, Jesus, we don't always know what to say or what the answers are, but one thing we do know is to cry out to you for mercy. And we do that now, not just for the events of a week ago, but for the brokenness of our world, which... Most of the time, we are indifferent to, but you see it all, and so we ask you, Lord Jesus, to have mercy, and now we ask you to speak to us through your word, in your name, amen. So with that said, let me ask you a question. Do you think the world is getting better or worse? Think about it for a minute. If you look at human history as a trajectory, I know you could take any incident and out of context and say it's getting better or worse, right? But if you think about human history as a trajectory, are things getting better or worse? You could make a case for both, right? I mean, there are radical advances in science and in technology and medicine. There's a lot we could say is getting remarkably better. But on the other hand, we do continue to oppress, exploit, and kill each other. Let me read to you two quotes by the same author, H.G. Wells. One written before World War II and one written after. Same man. Before World War II, he writes this. Can we doubt that presently our race will more than realize our boldest imaginations, that it will achieve unity and peace, and that our children will live in a world made more splendid and lovely than any place or garden that we know, going on from strength to strength in an ever-widening circle of achievement? What man has done, the little triumphs of this present state, form but the prelude to the great things man has yet to do. That quote encapsulates what we might call the the positivism of the Enlightenment era, right? We're getting better through, through human ingenuity and scientific advance and achievement. We're, the world is getting better. 
civilization, civilization is improving. After World War II, the same man, H.G. Wells, writes this. The cold-blooded massacres of the defenseless, the return of deliberate and organized torture, mental torment, and fear to a world from which such things had seemed to well-nigh banished, been banished, has come near to breaking my spirit altogether. Homo sapiens, as he has been pleased to call himself, is played out. That's the same guy. Very different views, isn't it? The biblical view of humanity and human history is neither the naive optimism of the Enlightenment, that we're just going to get better because we can make it better, but neither is it the skeptical pessimism or, or jaded pessimism of the postmodern era. Because the focus of the biblical view is not on how bad things are at present or how good they might become. It's on Christ and his kingdom, on who he is. So it's not, it's not naively positive, nor is it jaded and skeptical. It's, neither is it somewhere just in between, like a happy medium. It's something different altogether. Last week, Pastor Brian told us that the Sermon on the Mount, which we began in a series called The Way of Blessing, is not a new set of religious rules to keep but it is a description of life in his kingdom, of how we're supposed to live. Let's pick up where he left off. Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 16. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven." Let me ask this question. What is Jesus implying about the world when he says we are salt and light? Clearly, we'll talk about what he means for us. He says you are salt and you are light. We'll talk about what that means for us. But he's also, if we're paying attention, I think he's implying something about the state of our world when he says that. What is he saying? What is Jesus implying about our world when he says you are salt and light? We think of salt, for that matter, as a condiment on a table, right? You know, the salt shaker past the salt. In the ancient world, many of you know that <laughs> that's not how it worked. Salt was a very precious commodity. It was a preservative. In fact, in the days before refrigeration, it was the only way to keep your food, particularly your, your, your perishables, meat, uh, keep it from spoiling or decaying. So for one thing, Jesus is saying, when he says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the preservative of the earth, he's saying the world is in a state of decay. Why else would it need salt? He's not just saying, hey, you give a little flavor to life, you Christians. See, the world is in a state of decay. Second, if you're the light of the world, what does that imply? You don't really see a light in a perfectly bright room, do you? Why turn on another light? You already have light. He's saying the world is in a state of decay and the world is in a state of darkness. Maybe not complete, but he's, his, his point is you are salt and light in a decaying and dark place that needs it, in other words. By calling us salt and light, Jesus is not just saying something about our role in his kingdom. He is. He's also saying something about the world in which we live. The first 10 verses of Matthew 5, Pastor Brian preached about last week, those are called the Beatitudes. We read the last one of the Beatitudes. That just, the, the blesseds, you know, and he, by the way, he, blessed doesn't just mean blessed, it means fortunate, lucky are. And it really is primarily a focused description of your relationship to God. Blessed are those who mourn, mourn over our own sin, those, those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's focused on our relationship, inner relationship with God. These verses, 11 through 16, are really focused on our relationship with the world as a result of our relationship with God. So let me just make sure we have the, we have the background here. You come to faith in Jesus Christ by his grace you find forgiveness at the cross, you lay down your life, and you're to, he comes into your life by the Holy Spirit and begins to renew you. And you, these Beatitudes, describe how you relate to him. And then out of that new relationship, not perfect person, but out of that new relationship, you're to live in the world in a different way. That's essentially the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. 
The first thing Jesus says is that we are to be a salty community. A salty community. My, my kids use the phrase salty to describe me when I'm grumpy. I don't think that's what Jesus means. Dad's a little salty. I don't think they're using Jesus language when they say that. Like, they don't mean that I'm, I'm really a preserving influence in the family. They mean I'm irritated. What is, that's not what Jesus means when he says, you are to be the salt of the earth. Verse 13 again. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste or saltiness, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Salt in the ancient world was extremely valuable. We mentioned this. In some cases, gold was more common than salt. Salt was harder to find, more difficult to mine than gold. In fact, in the early days, the B.C. days of the Roman Empire, before Jesus' day, salt, many of the Roman legions, the average Roman soldier, was paid his wages in salt. You ever heard the phrase, he's worth his salt? That's where it comes from. In fact, the, the, the Latin word for salary, where we get our English word salary, is salarium. Salarius. That comes from the root word salarium, which is the word for salt. Salt was valuable, precious, and hard to come by. The point is, salt was extremely valuable in the ancient world. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. You are valuable to this world. You are to be precious, important in it. Not by the world's standards of importance. He's saying, you who would follow me are to be incredibly valuable to the world because you are working against the forces of decay. How does this happen? Specifically, how? In order for salt to act as a preservative, it needs to be worked into the meat. My grandfather used to like salt pork. It's kind of gross. Anybody like that? He used to salt his own meats. Taught me how to do it. I did it once and haven't done it since he taught me. But if you've ever done this or seen it done, you know, you don't just sprinkle a little salt on it or put salt near it. It has to be rubbed in, into the meat. The point is it has to penetrate. It has to get into that which it's to preserve. Unless it penetrates the surface and gets into, it won't have a, a preserving effect. So Jesus says, you, by the way, we read you, and this, the, this, is a, this is a fault of the English language. We don't always have good words to translate what's written in Greek. We read you as individual, me, you, me. It's a plural you here. He's saying, you all, my, my followers, you together, collectively, are the salt of the earth. You and I are to be so engaged in our world that our gospel influence has a preserving effect. And this will not happen at a distance. In our school systems, political systems, now more than ever, in science, art, business, education, economics, and so on, so in, though, in every arena of life, those of us who follow Jesus should live with generosity and self-sacrifice and courage and conviction of the truth and compassion and seeking justice and mercy and be so different that we have a preserving effect. A salty community. So uh, when, we, when we were looking at our uh, design plans for the next phase of what we, what we might hope God might do here in terms of our expansion, we, we were talking about, this is years ago, we were talking about um, the expansion, and rumor got around that we might, that the FBCG was thinking of leaving Geneva, which wasn't true. The mayor's office talked to our design build firm and says, just tell them don't leave the community. We really need that church here. I was so encouraged to hear that. Pastor Brian mentioned this from the book, The Art of Neighboring, which I've read and mentioned to him and I've quoted it before, that every Christian should be a gift to his or her neighborhood or street, and every church should be a gift to its city or community. I don't know if that's always true, but it should be. That's what Jesus is saying here. They may not agree with you. They may not like everything that you stand for. They may not even believe what you believe. But the people at least ought to be say, saying, huh, you know, I don't know if I believe all that stuff that they believe, but I sure am glad about what they're doing in our community. I sure am grateful for the way they're involved. They sure seem to care about what goes on in this town, in this neighborhood, in this community. The second image Jesus uses is, is light. So we're to be a salty community and a shining community. Let me read again verses 14 and 15 of Matthew 5. I'm not sure if I put these in the, on the screens, but I'll read them for you. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, 
but on a stand that gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now, there's some interesting contrast here between salt and light. Salt works from within, right? Has to get inside. Light shines from without. I mean, you could have an inner light, but light comes from outside, right? Shines into the darkness. Salt is somewhat hidden when it's doing its work. You don't see it. Light's visible, by definition. Salt is subtle, secret. Light's fairly direct and obvious. Both salt and light are really miraculous things if you think about it. My daughter is uh, thinking of chemical engineering, which is, I, I stopped being able to help her in math when she was in fourth grade. So <laughs> she's way beyond me for, for college. And she was, I was talking to her about this. She says, yeah, sodium chloride. You know, Dad, that's interesting because both of those elements that make up salt are very unstable, even explosive by themselves. I was like, oh, really? That's good information. Of course I knew that, honey. <laughs> that's, you know. But th- I started thinking about that. She's right. Sodium chloride, ind- independent individually, are dangerous, unstable. Put them together to become a stable element that's edible and precious and valuable and has a preserving influence. There's, it's kind of miraculous, really. Speaking of light, have you ever read a def- definition of light? How would you define light? Here's what Webster says. There, brother, there's like 15 definitions. That which makes vision possible. I could have come up with that. The sensation aroused by visual receptors. Or if you want a more technical definition, here's one. Electromagnetic wavelength range, including infrared, ultraviolet, x-ray, and in a vacuum with a speed of 186,281 miles per second. Specifically, the part of this range that is visible to the human eye. Huh? (laughs) The point is, it's hard to define what light is. But you know it when you experience it. You know it when it shines on you. You know it when you see it. Jesus is saying to us, you are to work in the world in which you live, into it, be kind of a hidden, subtle, secret influence, and at the same time, to shine into the dark parts of that world. We are to be a shining community. I think it's important, the first metaphor Jesus uses when describing uh, our shining community is a city on a hill. The Greek word there is polis, meaning population center, city. A city on a hill. You can't be a city by yourself. Do you know that? It takes all of us. Jesus says, collectively, my people in the world are to be like a city on a hill. See an image here of Jerusalem at night. I took this when I was my, with my wife and Pastor Brian and, and, and Loreen in uh, Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives looking across the, the Kidron Valley at uh, Jerusalem at nighttime. Really a beautiful picture. That's with modern lights, of course. In the ancient world, It would simply be all the lamps and torches burning and fires. Nonetheless, in our culture, it's hard to be experienced night as true darkness, right? You don't, there's always lights on almost everywhere you go. You'll have to be in certain parts of the world where it's really, really dark. You ever been on a a trip where there are are no man-made lights around? You realize, boy, the night can get really dark. In the ancient world, a city on a hill would have stood out. Jesus says that. You're the light of the world. Interestingly, in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Then he says, you are the light of the world. Did he change his mind? No, I think he's saying, insofar as you reflect my glory, insofar as you live for me, insofar as you seek my kingdom, you're like me, a light in the world. In John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, we're told that the light of the world is Jesus, and that light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. So when Jesus says we are the light of the world, he's saying that when we honor him and glorify him and live for him, we shine his light. In verse 15, we're meant to shine it this way, right? You don't light a lamp and put it under a basket. I would just think the basket would burn up, but you wouldn't do that, right? You wouldn't hide it under something. Why would you do that? You light a lamp for what purpose? To give light to everyone in the house. So there's both an individual aspect, he says a lamp, and a city, a corporate aspect to this. Any of you grew up in Sunday school singing the song, This Little Light of Mine? Anybody? Those of you that didn't grow up in Sunday school, you didn't miss that much. But this song, This Little Light of Mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? Tied under a bush, what do you say? Oh no, right? <laughs> I'm going to let it shine. Silly. But Jesus' point is just that. The the point and purpose of light is to illuminate. It's to dispel darkness. But how? That's all good church talk. 
How, how do you do this? I was thinking about this, like, how can we make this practical? What does it mean? You leave here and you go about your business, you're going to go out to eat tonight or wherever you're going to go, enjoy some more of the sunshine, the light that's left in this day, and you get up tomorrow and you do whatever you're going to do and the next week comes. How do you live as salt and light? What is it, what do you do specifically? Well, we could make a very long list. Let me give you just five things, five practical ways you can shine. Number one, These are not on the screen. You have to write these down and listen. Ha ha. Talk about God's love openly. It should not be a secret that you love Jesus. I I once asked a young man that I was kind of mentoring and discipling uh, who was taking a job, and he says, my boss is not a believer, and I'm a little nervous about it. And I asked him how it was going. He says, oh, great. Nobody even knows I'm a Christian yet. I said, that's great. (laughs) Now, I don't think you walk in on day one and says, I love Jesus, you know, and, and, and make a big become obnoxious about it, but it should not be a secret to those who know you, live next door to you, work in the cube next to you, go to school with you, take their kids where you take your kids. It should not be something hidden that you love him. Talk about God's love openly. Talk about the things that God is doing in your life and that you're praying for openly. Don't be ashamed. I remember a guy that I, I'm in a relationship with now, an accountability men's group with, and he told me once when you know, he works downtown and rides the train, and he said he realized over time that he had developed two answers to the question of how are you doing? A Christian answer and a, an everybody else answer. The Christian answer, he would talk about the things that God was doing and he was praying about and that were important to, to God in his life. But the everybody else answer was, you know, eh, my kids are this, and they kind of just the, the, the pat answer. He says, I, I realize I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to have one answer. So I started talking openly with my friends at work, none of them were believers, about what God was doing. He says, you, <laughs> some people are like, uh-huh, and they move away from you. <laughs> but he said, so it gave me lots of opportunities. And it wasn't an obnoxious way. It was just a chance to talk openly about the love of God in his life. I mean, how many of you are afraid to wear your Cubs shirt in public? I'm not. <laughs> So you're like, I don't even own one. I like the socks. Well, too bad for you. We pray, we pray for you. You know, you, we wear the stuff, our allegiances on our chest, right? Our sports teams, the things we're interested in or excited about. Why would we be ashamed just to talk about the love of God in a non-threatening, winsome way? Number two, be generous with your time and money. One of the most profound ways to be salt and light is to be generous people. I feel like sometimes I fight against temptation to be, I'm always trying to conserve time for my family, time for me and our income and protect our little thing, right? Do you ever feel that way? I think that's that's runs contrary to what God wants in my heart. He wants us to be generous people. This is not a pastoral plea for money to the church. That's all I'm saying. I'm saying be generous people. Giving of yourself to those around you. Even if it costs you something. And for some of you, you would think, well, I'm, I'm fine with my time, but just don't touch my pocketbook. Well, that's your issue. For others of you, it's like, hey, listen, money's not really a problem for us. I'm happy to write a check, but time is precious. Well, that's your issue. One of the ways we can be salt and light in this world is to be generous in every area. Number three. This is an interesting one. I was trying to think specifically. Speak well of others at all times. I think it's so common, even in, especially even in Christian circles, for us to talk poorly about people when they're not around. I would put it this way. Encourage people to their face and praise them behind their back. When, when they're with you, tell them how glad you are to see them and how great they are and mean it. Ask about their lives. And when they're not with you, talk to other people about how, what God's doing in them and how grateful you are for them. When I was coaching football at Batavia High School many years ago as a volunteer, I noticed that it was just sort of par for the course for the coaches to rip on their wives in the locker room. You know, not just, you know, the old ball and chain kind of stuff. They just said stuff like that all the time. I started making a mental note, I'm not doing that. And so I just refrained from doing that. Then I thought, that's not enough. I should praise my wife in their, in, you know, in public to them. That got weird. <laughs> huh? It was so different. My point is, it stood out. It was so different. Let's be the kind of people who are not just generous with our time and money, but with our words. Who your friends can trust you when they're not around. That you speak well of them. And your neighbors too. It's attractive, isn't it? When you're around people like that, it stands out. Fourth, 
Lead your family business life with integrity. Be men and women of integrity who speak the truth, who don't cut corners, even if they can get away with it, even if it's in the gray area. Talked to a man just a few weeks ago who worked in the hedge fund industry. And he told me this story how uh, he got involved in this business and these ventures and it was, they were operating in the margins of the law. And he was making a lot of money. He said, I knew, although I wouldn't let myself admit it at the time, I knew that what we were doing was maybe technically legal but was unethical. And it all came crashing down and he lost everything. He says, I don't regret losing everything. I regret that I'm supposed to be a Christ follower. I let myself get involved in that. I knew better. Whatever the case, you, you, your moms, if you're staying at home with your kids, if you're, if you're in the working force, if you're in school, just live your life with integrity. Be above reproach. And number five, and we can make a longer list, but I'll stop with five. Ask questions and learn to listen. I struggle with this one. I like to talk. Maybe that's a pastoral curse. I'd much rather, sometimes I feel like I'm listening just for the chance for you to stop talking so I can tell you what I think, you know? I think people that are salt and light are good listeners. Listen to other people's stories. Ask their stories. Listen to them. I've, I have found, and I still struggle with this, one of the best ways to have people listen to you talk about your love for God is to listen to them. You listen to someone else long enough, eventually they'll ask you, well, what do you think? I've asked you what you think. I've, you've asked them what they think, and you've listened to them long enough. Maybe eventually they'll say, well, you know, what do you think about this? Where do you find your hope? How do you deal with this? And you have a chance to, to share. Anyway, just very simply, to talk openly about God's love, to be generous with our time and money, to speak well of others to their face and behind their back, to lead our lives with integrity, and to learn to listen well. Our five ways, practically, I think we, we can be salt and light. To be a community of light means to illuminate, to shine in the darkness. But have you ever been in a dark room or been out or, uh, and, and, uh, and had walked out into a bright sunlight? Or had the lights turned on? What happens to you immediately? What's your first reaction? Hallelujah! No, what is it? What do you do? You squint, you hide your eyes, you go, oh, it's so bright, right? Why do roaches run when you turn the lights on? Because <laughs> I'm going to kill them if I don't. Well, lights come on, right? And our first reaction, if we've been in darkness, is that it hurts. It takes a while to adjust to it. Or for that matter, salt if it gets in your eyes. Or is rubbed into a wound. It stings. This brings us back to the first couple of verses we read. Let me read verses 11 and 12 again for you. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is a difficult and often overlooked truth. If we truly live as salt and light in the world, we will inevitably suffer for it. A suffering, a persecuted community. Verse 11, notice Jesus does not say if. If people insult you, if people uh, falsely accuse you, if people say evil things against you. He says when. 2 Timothy 3.12 says anyone, for those who will live a godly life in Christ Jesus, will be persecuted. Now we don't know much about this in our culture. We don't feel persecution the way we read about it in the Old Testament or that it goes on in other parts of the world today. We're relatively comfortable and secure. And so when anybody questions what Christians believe, we feel we get all nervous about that. We're not good with this. Now insults, persecution, and false accusation. If I, just think about that for a minute. Blessed are you when people insult you and falsely accuse you. If I said insults and persecution and false accusation, most of us would think that either if that's, if that's going on in our life, either God is doing something wrong or we are, if we're being insulted and falsely accused. We would think something's wrong here. Jesus says, nothing's wrong. That's, that's normal. That's to be expected. In fact, blessed are you. Fortunate and lucky are you. Why? It's a good sign, in other words. It's normal to be expected. It has always been this way for those who would follow me in the world. It's not unusual, and you should not be thrown off, and you should not think something's wrong. Now, if it's all persecution all the time, that might not be good. But here's an important distinction. 
Look at the latter half of verse 11. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Your Bible might say, because of me. That's important. Because of me, Jesus. So it's not blessed are you when people falsely accuse you because of you, right? It's not blessed are the obnoxious or blessed are the arrogant or the selfish. He's saying when people accuse you and persecute you and think poorly of you and speak poorly of you because of Christ, that's to be expected, that's okay. The promise of blessing is not applied to those of us who are obnoxious about our faith or in other people's faces or arrogant or accusatory. The promise of blessing of Jesus applies to those of us who experience these things on his, for his sake. I think it's interesting that verse 11 says that this is going to happen. People, some people, when you live as salt and light in the world, are going to see that and reject it. Reject you and your Jesus. And verse 16 says that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. What does that mean? It kind of bookends this passage. One verse says some people will see your life. You're trying to live out as salt and light in the world for the glory of God and his kingdom. And they're going to reject you and, say, say, and speak badly of you and reject Jesus going to happen. Other people are going to see you, and they're going to say, huh, I'm intrigued by that. I want to know more, and eventually come to praise the God who you are representing. You're going to have both. It's a description of life in the kingdom as a witness in the world. You are responsible for your saltiness and your shininess, not for how people respond to you. That's our calling. I, um, I like watching, well, I like watching all kinds of movies, actually, and quoting them as well. I was watching Monty Python with my kids. They, they don't really know Monty Python. I'm introducing them to the, to the glory that is Monty Python recently. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's an acquired taste. I'm just cracking up and quoting it. They're going, this is weird, Dad. Anyway, but, well, I like watching old movies, too. I think we've lost uh, the storytelling of some of the older movies, even though the special effects are terrible and, like, the, shoot, the shootouts are lame. But the stories are powerful. One, I, I liked a, a movie called Angels with Dirty Faces. Anybody ever seen that movie? It's a, movie, it's a 1938 or 39 movie with Jim, Jim, James Cagney. It's a gangster movie. And, um, and thinking about the way this, this, this the idea of being persecuted falsely. Uh, the story is this. So James Cagney plays a guy named Rocky, and his best friend is a little boy named Jerry. And they bro- both grow up in the slums of the Bronx. Uh, Pat O'Brien, the actor, plays Jerry. And they both uh, uh, grow up in rough area, and they, they, they commit a robbery together when they're young. And because uh, Rocky try, stops to help Jerry uh, get, get untangled from uh, the train tracks, um, Rocky gets caught by the police, and Jerry gets away. Anyway, Rocky, uh, Jerry becomes a priest in the neighborhood, working with uh, underprivileged kids that are wayward. And uh, Rocky, J- James Cagney, uh, and becomes a gangster. And it's about their life as they grow up. At the end of the movie, Rocky, James Cagney, is on death row. And uh, his old friend, the priest, Jerry, uh, comes to see him on death row. And he says, look, um," he he prays with him and he talks about him. And he says, look, all the kids that I work with, they're all on their way to becoming like you. They're all on their way to becoming gangsters. Because they idolize you. Because you never give an inch to anybody. You spit in the eye of everyone. You don't take anything from anybody. And they all think you're uh, amazing and they all want to be just like you. And Cagney is silent. He says, I need you to do me a favor. He says, what, what can I do? I'm about to be executed. He says, I want you to be a coward and cry out and die a coward's death when you go to the chair. I want you to give up your pride and die as a coward. And he goes, that's ridiculous. My pride is all I have left. It's the only thing they haven't taken from me is my pride. It's all I have left. Why would I give that up? How would that possibly help? He says, because if the kids see you as a coward, maybe they won't idolize you. They, they argue back and forth, and Cagney, the Rocky character, says, kind of just forget you. And... But then at the end of the movie, you hear, you don't see James Cagney being executed, and he cries. He screams out, I'm afraid to die, blubbering like a little baby. And then the movie kind of ends there. He, he died as a coward. Why? He did what his friend asked, so it might save the life of some of these boys. Now, what does Philippians 2 tell us about Jesus? In a a profoundly similar and different way. 
He died a criminal's death. He took on the nature of a servant. He humbled himself. He became nothing. He was reviled and mocked and spit on, falsely accused. Why? To save us. So that by, by him suffering an, an undeserved death, we might be liberated. We might be saved. So, so when you live your life as salt and light in your business, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your community, and when some people look at you and scoff, or some people just don't respond well, or you feel nervous about it, or you hear that they talk about you this way, that's a sm- number one, that is a small price to pay. Number two, Jesus says, that's good. That means they notice. That means they see a little bit of me in you. Because the same thing happened to me. I'm not saying I live this way all the time. Most of the time, I, if I'm honest, I live for me. But I think God is saying to us, to you and to me and to us, I want you to be salt, light, preserving that which without you would decay and shining the light of my gospel truth into the dark places of this world. And you can't do that from a distance or if you're hidden. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you indeed are the light of the world and that your light shines into our hearts by the truth of your gospel. And that when we live our lives for you and not for ourselves, some measure of that light is reflected back in the world. And it doesn't take us long to see that our world is a dark place and it's in desperate need of more light. Help us by your grace and spirit to be the light this world needs. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.